Okay, we looked at this passage um, last time, two weeks ago, but there were a few bits we didn't look at. And rather than try and shoehorn them all into the same sermon, I wanted to come and, um, and uh, look back with you at those bits from this passage. And especially I want to focus this morning on verses 17 and 18. John writes this, When I saw him, that's Jesus, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. When was the last time you fell over in awe and wonder? Uh, for me, I've never fallen over in awe and wonder. Maybe some of you have. I don't know, you might have tripped over something. But you just stepped back, I don't know, it's possible. But I'd be surprised. I'd, I'd be interested to hear, actually, if anyone has actually fallen over just for sh- sheer sort of awe and wonder at something. Now, no doubt you've seen many awe-inspiring sights in your life. Um, we've got a, a Windows 10 laptop. You start it up and it gives you, a, pretty much each time you start, it gives you a different view, a different all, all around the world, I mean, all over the place. Uh, uh, beautiful scenery. Really, some awe-inspiring photographs. And I quite enjoy the fact that it does that and keeps showing me different things in, in this world. I love sunsets. I don't know if you love sunsets. I know some of, you love, some of you love sunsets. I love starry skies. I love majestic mountains. I love Eastbourne Seafront. Lots of things in this world are impressive and majestic and awe-inspiring, aren't they? And maybe if you're like me, you, you, you find some human achievements pretty awe-inspiring as well. Uh, when I go to London, you step out of Victoria Station and you see some, pretty immediately, you see some pretty impressive buildings. Now, those buildings are built to impress, aren't they? They're built to, to make, uh, you know, the, the, visit, the foreign visitors go, mm, London's a pretty good city, it's on the map, yeah. Uh, they're made to impress and, and I confess they have that effect in me. They may not in you, but they do in me. I like the noisy jets in Airborne. I don't know if you do. and you're, Some of you are thinking, shaking your heads, but I like the noisy jets in Airborne. I like all those impressive things as well. But I've never yet fallen down awestruck. Maybe you have, but I haven't. But in this passage, John does that. He falls down awestruck. He crumples to the ground, and it seems that he sort of, you know, in a state of paralysis or, you know, incapacitated, lying there on the ground. Why is that? Because he sees something of the glory of Jesus. Now, I've argued before, on a couple of occasions, that the glory of Jesus that John sees here is the diluted, toned-down version. This is not the full thing. In actual fact, uh, you can compare Jesus here to uh, uh, vision, uh, the vision Daniel has in the in, um, in second half of the book of Daniel. And you'll see that Jesus looks in some ways like the angel described there. And so Jesus, in many ways, is, is toning down his glory to sort of merely angelic levels here. But nonetheless, John is absolutely uh, awestruck. And the point I want to start with this morning is that the glory of the risen Lord Jesus is truly awesome, way beyond the greatest earthly glory that you have seen or could see. The heavenly glory of the risen Lord Jesus is truly awesome. Now, to take in the awesome glory of Jesus, we actually need to be given new bodies fit for it. Our current bodies would wither up. It's like if you put our current bodies you know, within, a, well within any, any close distance to the sun, we would just shrivel up. And so it is, if you put us in the, in the, in the presence of the full, unedited, uncensored, untoned down glory of Jesus, we would just wither and do more than John. We need to actually have new bodies in order to do that. And that's what the gospel promises us. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50 says that Um, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. The perishable, which is currently what you and I have, uh, perishable bodies, cannot inherit the imperishable. We just can't cope with it. But the gospel promises us new bodies that can cope with it. New bodies that can drink in 
the glory of Jesus. And not just that, but the gospel also promises us an eternity of time in which to drink in, in which to use our new, resurrected, glorified, turbocharged bodies to drink in the glory of Jesus. That's what we'll be doing for eternity. Now, sometimes Christians, I think, are... Well, let me think about this. Are Christians thought of as living a life devoid of pleasure? Now, I hope in some ways that uh, that is so. In one sense, I hope that we aren't known as people who are given to pursuing uh, excess, well, the excesses and the evils that this world revels in. So I I hope in one sense that we are known as people who, who say no to certain pleasures. But I also hope that Christians are known for being people who pursue a pleasure of such magnitude that it doesn't even compare with the things that people revel in in this world. The hedonists of this world, the pleasure seekers of this world, uh, seek a puny pleasure. They're not pleasure seeking enough. And I hope that as Christians we are seeking a greater pleasure than the pleasure seekers of this world. Because we're seeking something that would, in its toned down version, bowl us over in our current bodies, but fill our attention and our wonder for eternity in our new bodies. That's the glory of Jesus. And that's life to the full. You see, Jesus came to give us life to the full, didn't he? People seek for life to the full in all the things that they go doing on a Saturday night or whatever it is. They're looking for life to the full. Life to the full is to be found in Jesus and in the intensity of joy that the gospel promises those who believe in Jesus for eternity in a way that you can't even imagine in our current bodies. Jesus came to give us life to the full. Now let's rewind our focus there because I want to look not at our future drinking in of Christ's glory but what our passage shows us which is our future encounter uh, sorry, our present encounter with Christ's glory in the here and now. I want to focus on Christ in his glory as he relates to us in our present state of weakness. Now, I think we're all, all in, a, in a state of weakness in one way or another. Uh, for me this morning, it's my voice. Uh, maybe other things as well. Maybe you are hounded by thoughts that disturb you and distress you. Maybe you have real sadness going on in your family at the moment. You've lost loved ones or you're just about to lose loved ones. All sorts of things cause us to be weak and low. Maybe it's your health, maybe it's the health of a loved one, I don't know. But fill in your own gap there. But all of us are in a state of weakness. Even the strongest of us feel frustrations. I want to think about Christ in his glory as he relates to us in our present state of weakness. Because it's in a state of weakness that we see John, certainly in our passage this morning, don't we? There he is, on the floor, and Jesus stoops and touches and speaks to him. And so I want to look at that encouragement of Jesus' words and actions to John on the floor. But before we get to that encouragement, I just want to consider one thing briefly, which touches on this subject, which is to do with falling on the floor. There are a lot of churches who are into falling on the floor in quite a big way, doing what John's doing here. They call it being slain in the spirit or whatever. And uh, very often uh, people will be lined up in a church and, and uh, the pastor will sort of go from one person to the, to the next and pray for them and possibly give them a nudge and down they're meant to go. It's, 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 it's huge in, in lots of churches. This is what they do. But we need to see just an answer to that from this passage. What we see in this passage is not Jesus appearing in his glory to John so that John collapses unconscious. That is not the purpose of Jesus here. Why does Jesus appear to John in our passage? I'll tell you why. It's to speak to the seven churches. It's to give the letters that are going to fill chapters 2 and 3. That's why Jesus appears to John in our passage. Jesus appears to John in our passage to build up his church, not by causing people to fall on the floor incapacitated, but to give them his word, to encourage them, to rebuke, actually we'll see some rebukes, to encourage, comfort, rebuke, and above all to show people himself from his word. That's what Jesus appears for, 
to John in our passage. And so we need to realise that the, the answer, if you like, to, to people falling over on the floor in these churches where they think that is beneficial, the answer is no, that is not beneficial. God's word is beneficial. The word that tells us about Christ and encourages us in him and shows us how to live our lives in him, that is what will build us up. That is what's beneficial for his church. So let's do that then. Let, let's, let's pursue uh, Jesus' words here. Uh, we're going to look at verse 17 to start with, but, but just bear in mind, this is the preliminaries to what's coming um, in, in the coming weeks in, in the seven letters in chapters 2 and 3. Let's, let's look to chapters, uh, verses 17 and uh, 18 then, to, w- with a view to, to being built up ourselves, with a view to having our minds touched with the good things of God's word and having our hearts and affections touched as well. Verse 17. When I, John, saw him, Jesus, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I'm the first and the last. We'll just stop there for a moment. It's interesting, I think, that Jesus places his right hand on John. It is quite specific. It's not his left hand. It's his right hand. As John is down on the ground, Jesus stoops down and places his right hand on John. Why is that interesting? Well, because before John fell down... John saw Jesus standing there amidst these seven golden lampstands and something was in Jesus' right hand. What was in Jesus' right hand? Verse 16. In his right hand he held seven stars. Now I tend to think of the hand as open but maybe we think of it as closed. A grip on these seven stars, I don't know. These seven stars, as we'll, we'll look at this next week I'm sure, but the seven stars symbolise, verse 20, they symbolise the angels of the seven churches. There are various views as to what these angels mean. I personally think the angels mean the messengers of the churches. Uh, That's what angel can also mean in both Greek and Hebrew. It can also mean messenger. And uh, the messengers of the churches, I think, would be the the pastor teachers, the, the preachers of those churches. And so I think this picture, this picture of Jesus holding these seven stars in his hand speaks of his leadership and directing of his churches as he holds these messengers in his hand. But though Jesus holds those messengers in his hand, all seven and the rest, the point I want to bring out is this. Jesus is not distant. He's not beyond our individual um, needs, as it were. You know, sometimes you, you read something uh, uh, that might say something like, uh, we're sorry, we're unable to enter into individual correspondence. Uh, they anticipate that, there's so many, that there will be so many uh, individual uh, requests and so on that they'd, they'd be overwhelmed. Well, in a sense, uh, what Jesus is doing here is, is saying the opposite to that. He is able to deal with us individually as well as continuing to keep a grip on what is going on on his churches. He's able to do that because he's not just man. He's the first and the last. He's the living one. He is God himself in human flesh. And so he is well able to keep his church running across the world, more than just seven congregations, across the world, and still meet individually with us as we come in our quiet times in the mornings or whenever you do that. Here then, Jesus, in his ascended glory, is not above, he's not beyond stooping down to this crumpled man on the floor, John, to touch him and to put his right hand on him, this individual he loves, to encourage him and comfort him and build him up. Christ and the church is talked of as the uh, uh, husband and bride. We shouldn't, though, think of the church is a faceless mass to Jesus. We are individually known to him. John 10 verse 3 says that Jesus calls each one by name and leads them out. He's a shepherd who knows each one of his flock by name. He knows you, he knows me. Last time we thought about the fact he knows South Street, which is pretty amazing. He has South Street in his hand. This time we're thinking individually as well. He knows you. He knows your name. He knows your needs. He knows your weaknesses. And he's there for you, reaching down to you. And what does Jesus say to John as he 
stoops down and puts his right hand on John on the floor. Well, firstly, he says, fear not. Do not be afraid. Fear not. Now, Spurgeon rather delightfully preached a whole sermon on this. And he describes, he starts this sermon by saying this. Fear not is a plant which grows very plentifully in God's garden. If you look through the lily, be- the lily beds of scripture, you will continually find side, uh, sorry, by the side of other flowers the sweet fear nots peering out among the doctrines and precepts. Very Spurgeon, isn't it? Very, very sort of his way of thinking of things. But it's great, isn't it? It's a great image. These flowers that are there throughout Scripture. And you, that's what you see. We see fear not uh, woven throughout Scripture. It's a fundamental note then of the gospel message that resonates throughout the Bible. And it's for the comfort of all those who love Christ. But if Jesus just said, fear not, don't be afraid, full stop, that's it. That would be rather empty, wouldn't it? Have you noticed that when people say, don't be afraid, it always, it's always followed by something else. So someone might say, don't be afraid, mummy will be here in a minute. Or, don't be afraid, uh, I'm not going to hurt you. Or, don't be afraid, I bring you good tidings of great joy. There's always something that follows it, whether it's in everyday life, in everyday, everyday speech, or in the Bible. And the point is that the fear not at the start, the don't be afraid at the beginning, is a signal saying, I'm going to comfort you now. I'm going to give you something worth holding on to, which if you hold on to, will be better than the fear that you're tempted to hold on to. And so Jesus here carries on by giving something that is the comfort that he wants to give to John. And not just to John, but it's written for us as well, isn't it? It's for our building up as well. So let's see what Jesus goes on to say. Fear not, he says, I'm the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I'm alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and Hades. For our comfort, Jesus points to himself. Do you see that? It's all about himself. It's all Jesus saying about himself. I died. I'm the first and the last, the living one. I'm alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and Hades. The comfort Jesus gives John there on the floor, feeling his weakness, is all Jesus. It's all himself. Now, we've already read about Jesus' love in the bit in, uh, earlier in chapter 1, verse 5. Second half of verse 5, John says, To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Christ has loved us in his redeeming death. He's loved us by freeing us from our sins by his blood. And now, having died and risen again on the third day, he still loves us. The love of God is from everlasting to everlasting. It's not just at a point. The love that caused Jesus to die on the cross is the same love he burns with now, living, glorified in heaven for his people. The bit here is where it says, um, holding the keys of death and Hades. That's speaking about Christ's victory over death. Jesus, you see, was in the tomb, as it were, under Uh, the lock and key of death, captive to death. But the tables are turned as Jesus is raised again. And he is now conqueror, defeater of death. And the point is that that the, the victory Christ has won over death wasn't just for him. It's all for us. Jesus took on human flesh for us, for his bride, his church. Everything he does in his flesh is for us. The death he died is for us. The life he now lives is for us. The victory he won over death is for us. The hymn says we're frail, uh, what does it say? Frail children of dust. Well, we had something similar in that psalm early, didn't we? Uh, The Lord remembers that, he knows our frame, he remembers that we're dust. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is on those who fear him. And so if we fear the Lord, if we live day by day repentant lives of faith in Christ, then, uh, then we, uh, we have God's love on us. We're not simply 
uh, dust that is just disintegrating and uh, going to carry on disintegrating until we die. We have the Lord's love latched onto us forever. John chapter 10 verse 28 says this. In fact, Jesus is speaking here and he's speaking about his sheep, those who are his. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Now do you see that the resonance that has with our passage is Jesus does have in his hand, visually, these seven stars representing the angels of the seven churches. And Jesus in John 10 says, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Or Romans 8, 35 to 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. What are the things you're most feeling weak about at present? Maybe you can think of those in your mind. Maybe it's your circumstances, I don't know. It'll be different for each one of us. But whatever it is, it is, it is included in Paul's list there. There is nothing in all creation, death nor life, um, neither um, things present nor things future, uh, angels nor rulers, nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ. So if you come to Christ humbly and repentantly confessing your sin and indeed are doing so daily it's not just a once for all but it's a daily life we begin when we become a Christian if that's the life you're living and you're trusting Christ and his blood to wash you clean of all your sin then you are his you belong to Christ you are held in his invincibly tight grip that is for your comfort. Nothing can separate you from his love. Nothing can separate you from his love. Psalm 1 talks about the fact that the wicked are like chaff that the wind blows away. And once you and I were like that chaff that the wind was just about to blow away, the wind of God's judgment was just about to come and blow us away to eternal destruction. But Christ has saved us from being that chaff whose life was just a brief moment followed by being blown away by God's judgment. Christ has loved us from everlasting to everlasting. And he's established us. He's established us not just for this life, so that you are secure from here to your death, day of your death, but beyond as well, beyond this life as well. Death will not separate you from the love of Christ. This is a great comfort to hold on to. Um, as, we, as we face our weaknesses, as we, as we have to cope with them day by day, and maybe for years to come, maybe for the rest of our lives, maybe there are certain things you are currently suffering now, you will have to face the rest of your lives. Maybe not all of them, but some things will come, other things might come in, in their place, other things might add, be added to them. We live this life, a life of weakness, but we have a great comfort that's being held out to us in God's word this morning. And I don't want us to think that the comfort that God's word is holding out to us is an idea. That would be a complete disaster. If you went away this morning think that, thinking that it, the comfort being held out to us is an idea, the idea of Christ's love. No. The point of our passage, the point of those two little verses are the comfort held out to us is one who is alive. A person who lives forevermore. Who was dead for our sins but is alive forevermore and nothing can destroy him or bring him down. This is what we hold on to for our comfort. It's Christ himself. There in the heavens, Christ of all mercy, there for us in the heavens. And he always will be there for us. When he became incarnate at Christmas time, when he took on our human flesh, he did so forever. He committed forever to loving us. 
to betrothing himself to us. An unbreakable covenant he made when he took on our flesh. I want to close with a, a few words from Psalm 73. Psalm 73 is, is a psalm of a bewildered man, a confused man. He's, he's confused by the topsy-turvy state of the world. He looks around him, he sees evildoers prospering and, and godly people faltering. And he thinks, what, what's going on? Have I lived this life in vain? What's the point in all this? And towards the end of the psalm, he, 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 looks, at the, he looks forward. He, he goes into the temple of God and he sees, he suddenly has the insights as to what's, what's going to happen, that God will put all things right. God will redeem his, uh, those who are his and, and he will judge those who persist in their evil. And to, uh, the, towards the very end of the psalm, the psalmist comforts himself with this. This is the comfort of a bewildered man who's going to continue having to live in this world, but this is what he holds on to as he does. I am continually with you, he prays. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterwards, you will receive me to glory. Receiving us after this life into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, or could be translated, will fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. All these passages this morning synthesised together. Their combined power woven together are holding out to us an imperishable hope. Jesus Christ, comfort in this life to your dying breath and then he will receive you to glory. And things will only get better. You'll be with him for that intermediate time between your death and resurrection And then the final trumpet will sound. And your body will, wherever it was laid, will be raised imperishable. And for all eternity, will be drinking in the glory of Christ. So this is what I have to offer you this morning. The glory of Christ, who is alive. He's not an idea. He's there real in the heavens. And he's there for those who love him and trust him. Let's pray together. Christ of all mercy, there in the heavens, risen and glorified for us, who died, who shed your blood to free us from our sins and to Make us into a people for God. We worship you. We thank you that you see us and know us. And right now, you have not just South Street and many other congregations on your heart, but you have named individuals who belong to you on your heart. All of us who've come to you and laid our lives in repentance and faith before you. Lord Jesus, we worship you for your great love that you've loved us with. We worship you for the comfort that you stoop down and bring John and us this morning. We pray that this comfort would comfort us in all our troubles. Father, you know the things that concern us, that frustrate us, that cause us pain and sadness. Father, may in those things we seek the, the comfort of Christ. May we seek the comfort of Christ in what we read in your word. May we seek the comfort of Christ in our Christian fellowship together. May we be a blessing to one another. And in our conversation, even in our conversation this morning over tea and coffee, may we encourage one another in Christ. Father, we thank you for him, our great saviour. Amen.